listeners and readers of awardswatch.com. This is the Awards Watch podcast brought to you by the site you know and love, awardswatch.com. Uh, I am your executive editor, Ryan McQuay. Joining me is your editor in chief, Eric Anderson. It's a me, Eric. <laughs> Papa? <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, uh, Papa. Uh, ciao, Papa. Oh, God. Ciao, Papa. Indeed. Mm. Well, uh, Eric and I are returning from the sunny skies and cool breezes of California, Los Angeles, uh, to be exact. Uh, we were at the AFI Film Festival together representing this wonderful site. And we got a ton of talk about some movies, maybe some Oscar prognostication, but Eric, this was like your second year at the, or was it was it your second or third time at, at AFI? Like my fifth. Okay, so this was your fifth time at AFI. Yes. And uh, what do you love about this festival so much uh, that keeps you coming back every year? I like that it's in the same time zone where I live, so That's traveling right. to it is pretty great. Yeah. Uh, I got it. Generally, I gotta... there's really good weather, except for our last day there. <laughs> well, it was really like rainy. Oh, on Monday, on Monday, it was pouring. Downpour. Yeah, when I was trying to travel and get out. Get Thank out goodness my... it wasn't during the festival with all the lovely and luscious red carpet gala premieres. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, for sure. Well, this is my first time mm -hmm. um, going. This is my second time only in LA. I got to get the full sort of week experience. It was it was a, a week of parties and premieres, and uh, I mean, all you needed was a. Bag of cocaine and be Damien Chazelle's new movie. You know what I mean? So, uh, <laughs> but it probably should have been at AFI. It probably should have been. Supposedly, the first uh, teases or the premieres of that will be next week. Yes. Uh, and we'll get first reactions out of that from everybody who sees it out in LA. Uh, there'll also be some other premieres as well that will be going on at the same time. So, it is a busy time for movies, and AFI chose. Uh, early in the month rather than usually in the middle of the month uh, to do their film festival. And this is also the kind of last big film festival that we have in the, the season. This is the end of the fall film festivals as we, as we know it and love it. Eric and I were starting off in the mountains of Telluride and we ended, um, you know, in Los Angeles together. So it was full circle for us, boss. It was really great. Um, and the first big gala premiere of the weekend uh, or the week, I guess, because it's five days was Bardo a false chronicle of a handful of truths, which was the new cut because they had cut 25 ish, 22 ish minutes uh, of the film. And uh, I know you'd already seen this, right? You saw this at mm -hmm. mill Valley again. So mm -hmm. how did it play for you on the third go around? You've seen it three times now. I know. I can't believe I've seen it three times. I'll probably end up seeing it another I might next week. I don't know. We'll see. Really? Wow. Um, I mean, I loved it. I liked the long version, but at the at the same time when it was done, I I told everybody around me I, I like it, but I can see where you could cut like five minutes out of several of these very, very long dreamlike sequences and surreal mm -hmm. sequences. And they did. They cut 22 minutes out. It's much more focused on uh, the family and their story and and to great success for doing so i think it's moving i think it's beautiful funny absurd uh i, I love it i think it's great i think it played really well here too there la yeah there la um no i i thought it played uh really well in the room uh, I think it's actually probably one of its more stronger suits at one of these fall festivals because it was not received its longer cut over at Venice or at uh, Telluride. And we kind of really don't even need to discuss the longer cut anymore because it's never going to exist probably. And we're never going to, we were lucky enough to see it. And, <laughs> and that's probably going to be those only audiences that did. And it's complete 180, I think, from the first time we saw it, Eric, because for me, I, I connected with it even more the second time i think the movie flows better and works a lot more as this introspective mood piece from a director that's trying to look deeply into his life um now that he's in the middle stages of it and i think um our favorite sequences are still there mm -hmm. 
I do think that there were some things that were cut that, um, that were totally fine with me, but I even was looking at you going, well, they, if they cut this part, that would even make it better because they cut this one part out of it and it would make the film a little bit more clear. And I guess the only problem then at that point is you're cutting so much, you, how, what do you have left? And um, it, it could have maybe, they didn't have time to do it, but a reshoot probably would have helped some of it. Um, but I think the movie is beautiful. I think uh, Daniel Jimenez Cacho is fantastic. Uh, that cast is extraordinary. The score is so playful score and is so, so beautiful. Good. And I mean, they, and that was the lovely thing I loved about AFI is before the film started, they played the score while you were getting to your seats. So you kind of get the feeling of what you're about to get into for any of these films or any of these gala premieres. Uh, That's a good while, point. While, uh, while it's going I, on. I, I like that too. Yeah. And so like, we had already heard the score going into it and it was, and it was just like, Oh, cool. We get the, mm, mm, yeah, this is, we're getting in the mood for Bardo again. You get, and, you get those horns. Those bop, bop, bop. Bop, bop. And, uh, you know, Alejandro Gonzalez and Yuritu on the score with, uh, with Dresner there, they mm-hmm. are collaborators on that one. And, uh, it's a, I, I think the cinematography for me really stood out the second go around because we were able to see this in, IMAX presentation, which was extraordinary. Uh, I think the the audience really dug it. They were laughing a lot more with it this time, uh, really vibing with uh, its out there middle sequence uh, with the giant party uh, that is still one of the highlight scenes of the year. And I don't know, just by the end of it, I kind of was sitting there going, man, I, I kind of want to watch it again. I think it's, I think it's a pretty damn good movie. It, it, I moved it up into my top five of the year after I saw it. I think it's, I, it's, it's a movie specifically, I think designed uh, to get it, uh, especially my sensitivities, but I really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and then we were able to go to the party and you were able to talk to some of the cast and, and we were mm-hmm. talking to any Ritu and, and be able to, kind of talk with the with everybody there who had either seen it before or hadn't seen it and it seemed to be a, a much better vibe for that film and it's not necessarily as dead as people thought it was right well afi is a really funny thing because all of these other festivals are around the united states and around the world and afi is the only one that's in los angeles and mm-hmm. you can get a slightly better read off of a film's reception because there are more industry people there more voters in in guilds and ampus and everything Mm -hmm. so i think it's a much closer and accurate version of the reception of a movie at least in terms of of awards Mm -hmm. uh than possibly other fests i it's one of the things i like so much about it it's a it's a great vantage point Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah it felt it felt different than Tell Your Ride. It felt different than No Valley. It, it, it was much it better told, reception. Much better reception. Movie still probably, you know, it's still one of Netflix's top contenders. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about another Netflix contender here in a couple minutes. But uh, they they are clearly, you know, I, it's like I told you, you don't cut 22 minutes out of a movie, try to reintroduce it to the world if you're if you're not going to you know, put the resources behind it in this race. And I know that the the reception early on was visceral, but you know, everything that seemed to get a visceral response early on, Eric has had a second wind uh, and it's still a long, long race. We haven't even seen anything nominated yet uh, for critics or guilds or anything. So, well, uh, except for and, Gotham and except for Nipa Gotham and European well, you know, awards. Well, yeah, but like big players in, in sort of the, the Oscar race, like yeah. I wouldn't necessarily count the, the gothams as that you know what i mean everything there's... counts yeah <laughs> just in different amounts next film we saw was uh, we got to see a special screening you and i of uh of devotion uh the glenn powell jonathan majors uh fighter pilot epic and uh i, I don't know about you i you know we're, we're living in a in glenn powell's world and, and we're going to be living futurely in jonathan majors world because he's going to be King the Conqueror, the new big 
giant baddie in the MCU. Um, and we're also living in in the world that, you know, Taka Maverick is our top film of the year in terms of box office. And <laughs> it's just is. And uh, but this is a, a much different story. I'm kind of curious what you thought of this Korean War um, fighter pilot epic. Well, it is the better Glenn Powell uh, jet fighter uh, movie of 2022. Oh. It is the better one mm. um no Not, I, that's I controversial stance i know i know i loved it it's um it's sweeping it is a much more emotional uh movie than i expected mm-hmm. that there are still lots of you know fighting sequences and plane sequences and all of that but it is much more focused on the relationship between Powell and Majors and everybody around them. It's uh it's it was it was pretty emotionally driven. I was just very surprised. Um it's also a true story, which lends itself to uh a really strong narrative. And mm-hmm. Majors was of course very good. Mm-hmm. His oh my god, that scene talking to himself in the mirror, oh my god. Multiple that times. Was, really i know but the first one was like exceptionally yeah. chilling yeah but powell gets to flex more than just muscles yeah. but like real good dramatic chops and crying mm-hmm. and you know i am a sucker for a very hot guy that cries so <laughs> it worked for me it's it's jd dillard as the director also the producer on the film uh did some episodes of uh of the outsider and slight a movie that came out a while back. And, um, and Glenn Powell's also a producer on the film as well. And it feels like a real labor of love put on the screen. I think, it, I think it's really exceptional. It really snuck up on me and, and how much I was liking. It is conventional, uh, in terms of how it is trying to tell the story. Absolutely. Um, but the, the sensitivity that is surrounding the film, I think is really a strong point. And it's built off the back of these two men and the relationship, and the chemistry between Jonathan Majors, who is a just an absolute star. I mean, you know, he's going to be in Ant Man and Creed next year um, as villains. Uh, but he's also just one of the most versatile actors we have. I mean, he's—I'll never forget his first big performance on screen in the last Black Man in San Francisco, which is still an all-time performance. And then, mm-hmm. you know, he is able to to carry this this performance as uh, Jesse Brown, who is such a important historical figure. And and yet the, the the job is what mattered the most to him. And then you have uh, Hutner played by Glenn Powell, who is his his wingman. He's also a superior officer in the relationship that they have together and, dy- and you know, dynamic, obviously, in the history uh, of our world at that current moment, right? Going into the Korean War with how uh, race was still handled uh, in, in America and in the military. Uh, I think it's a really, really good, solid film between the two of them. I, I think that the sound work is uh, extraordinary here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I think uh, Shanda Dancy's uh, score is very sweeping, very epic for the scope of this movie. But it's really Eric Messerschmidt's cinematography that, I mean, my God, it is gorgeous. This movie is gorgeous to look at. Uh, well, not I mean, just because of the did, men that are on screen, but because it did of cost the... ninety million dollars, yeah. so it is there. Mm-hmm. It is it is on screen. the the uh, The cinematography and visual effects convergence is really really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, most exceptionally in that one plane crash sequence, which is you know one shot, depending on. I guess how you define one shot, <laughs> but it is exceptional. It's, it is one of the best of the year. So it's a, and it's, yeah, it's a great looking film. Yeah. I think some of the supporter characters are a little uh, wooden, um, uh, you know, Thomas. Well, there's uh, not much of, to them. Yeah. They're very generic sort of stereotypes, but I mean, they sort of help these two guys uh, through everything. I, they look I, like I, the ride out of Ryan Murphy central casting. I, they really did. I was like, like Joe Jonas, are you, really? Are mm. you a hot white brunette? Not too tall. <laughs> we got a role for you. For you. Hollywood's going to put you in a picture. 
Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a it's a solid uh, action film. I think it'll I think it'll do really well uh, with with the audiences that find it during the holiday season. Very uh, family friendly sort of affair. Um, but I'm also glad none of us took it in the uh, movie draft because $90 million budget. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to make that back. Uh, I'm telling you, it was, it was like, could this be a bomb pick? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, but you don't I want think, it to I be. think they're re-releasing Top Gun in December. Yeah. Which will just, that's, that's nah, just, just like going to take all mean. the money. That's yeah. just mean. That means that lead for the summer movie draft goes up more and more, right? As we... No, anyway, I'll continue. Um, <laughs> I was able to catch uh, Senior, which is the uh, documentary that premiered at the Telluride Film Festival that we were at, that we were not able to see, even though it, I think it screened like 600 times there, I want to say. Um, and uh, this is a, a movie uh, produced by and featuring Robert Downey Jr. and is about his father, Robert Downey Sr., who was this uh, visionary American director. Uh, he was kind of, you know, counterculture comedies in the sixties and seventies, very out there, very against the grain of what would happen in normal Hollywood when you're making films at that time. Very, uh, very much also uh, just about his filmmaking and how he makes his styles of films. It was done. So uh, not just from clips that you see throughout the film, but also the documentary itself it almost becomes senior's last big project that he's doing. And then you counter that with Robert Downey Jr.'s career, uh, their relationship as father and son and uh, the last moments that they've sort of have together before um, uh, seniors Parkinson's takes uh, full um, control over him. It is a very, very heartwarming film. It's unlike Robert Downey Jr. You know, to let himself and his guard down uh, this late in his career because he is Iron Man. He is Tony Stark. He is this bigger than life figure that we have now, but it's a very sensitive uh, portrait of a father and son relationship and, um, I, I, and, and played really well. And uh, Downey was there uh, with his wife, Susan Downey and the um, uh, Chris Smith, uh, the director and Kevin Ford, uh, the producer, and they did a Q and a with John Favreau after the, after the film, um, wasn't the greatest Q and a in the world, but it was at least, uh, you know, very insightful into the process of making it. You haven't seen the film yet, right? No, no, uh, I, I, I have not. We do have a review, uh, from Catherine Springer on the site, which of course I read, um, mm-hmm. which kind of implied that it, that the story became less about Robert Downey senior's career and then a little bit changed its focus to Robert Downey Jr. And she was not as into it as, Mm. uh, as the, the concept leading into it, that it would really be a bit of a, more of a retrospective of senior. Uh, I I could see someone thinking that I don't think it's like a full, like, let's look at Robert Downey Jr.'s career. You know, Um, I think it's his father cast him at a very, very young age in his films. And his start in the business was, you know, with his father directing him and everything. And when he was in turbulent times, his father leaned into him doing experimental films, uh, you know, in, in when he was down on his luck. And then it becomes about their family more than anything by the end in the lasting legacy of of this big superstar having this equally important father figure. And what's he going to say? What's he going to do? What's, uh, you know, for the last couple months and then also having to fight through seeing each other during the pandemic and everything. And, uh, but then also, I mean, the whole film is there's two versions of this film. And what's so interesting about it is the movie we see now, they had no idea that they were even close to having the footage that they had because he wouldn't allow Robert RDJ, his father wouldn't allow him to actually make and get the questions and the answers that he wanted to make a standard biopic. So I think um, it was, it's, it's a very interesting film when the subject matter is pushing back against um, the person trying to make it and it's his own son. So there's a little bit of that great meta contextuality within the film too. But um, you know, it's kind of hard when you have Robert Downey Jr. Also there too, to not want to look into him a little bit, but I don't think it, uh, derails it at any point. And I think the last 15 minutes of the film are very emotional. Um, I don't know how it's going to play uh, for, you know, documentary awards. I, I think like 
it's easily going to be that one where we're all like, yeah, it makes all the critics lists or whatever. And then it just like, doesn't make the short list or, you know, or doesn't get, you know, embraced by, you know, the documentary branch because it's too sentimental, you know, or it's, or it's, uh, you know, it's just not up their alley. But if they, if they did embrace it, it would be because it's about a filmmaker and it's about um, someone who um, was kind of secretly influential in in his work well, it is netflix and they mm-hmm. are doing more with this than any of their other documentaries True. Uh, and it's a little unusual because every year they're pretty good in this category and yeah. they've won a few times but there's no icarus there's no american factory uh mm-hmm. on the netflix slate for docs so this there's might no, be their best chance no, like this in descendant and yes yeah. it's, it's not a lot really i think descendant probably be their best better play too but yeah uh, yeah um it also that movie got tons of wonderful reviews out of sundance earlier in the year Mm -hmm. um there's also no this is not a my octopus teacher situation either (laughs) you know i mean so where i think that that could you know take over but you never know we'll see we never thought that that octopus was gonna get his tentacles into all of us right eric uh and anyway next movie feel our heart right um well the next film is a big film for us. Uh, We were able to go to the U S premiere of Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. And it was a, it was a big night. Uh, We, uh, the whole cat, pretty much uh, the principal people of the cast were there, um, including then the director and writer of this film, which is obviously the Academy Award winner, Guillermo del Toro, his co-director, uh, was also there as well. Mark Gustafson, who is most notably known as the, the like the animated director um, or assistant director on Fantastic Mr. Fox, which is um, still Wes Anderson's best film, in my opinion. And uh, we've seen a ton of Pinocchio movies. Even this year, we saw like the weird animated version, right? That, 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 that from that small budget studio. And then we saw the Zemeckis film, which re- came out right before TIFF and, uh, was considered one of the worst films of the year. And so it was just very skeptical. We held the review uh, for this festival. And um, Eric, what did you think of Pinocchio? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, if you were anywhere in my short, small radius from after the movie, you know how I felt about it. Yeah. I was, uh, I had to leave the theater (laughs) uh, (laughs) because I was very emotionally distraught. It, Mm -hmm. um, it hit me in a very personal way. Uh, I, not that it will for, for everybody, but in a very surprising way, Mm -hmm. uh, it is, has a huge heart. It's, um, I, I had tweeted it after I saw it. I had never really looked at Pinocchio quite as the adoption allegory that it is, but it very, very, very much feels like it in this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, of course, gorgeously animated, just really unlike any stop motion I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you have a chance to look at any of the behind the scenes, please, please do, because... It's, it's more complicated than you would possibly believe. It's it's not just, you know, molding some clay and moving it. <laughs> it's much more. These are clay and wood and animatronic and it's every possible type of creation. It's um it's a beautiful film. It's perfectly voiced. Gregory Mann is incredible. Oh, just wonderful as both Pinocchio and Geppetto's son, Carlo, who dies, which is the whole purpose and creation of of Pinocchio. It's definitely darker and crueler and scarier than a lot of Pinocchio's. And I think think the type of stop-motion animation makes it so. Not that it looks real, but it just, there's something more, it's the three-dimensionality of, these puppets that give it a very different life and, and feel. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I loved every single second of it. I was so skeptical going into this movie 
because I'm so sick and tired of Pinocchio movies. I'm so sick and tired of like movies getting remade 700,000 times. Well, a lot and of these things are now in the public domain, so anybody can make them. We're going to get like 25 great Gatsby's in the next couple of years. It's going to be yep. ins- ins- you know, insane. Um, and and I've also, I've been a little down on, on Del Toro recently. I'm not the biggest fan of Shape of Water. I was mixed on uh, Nightmare Alley. Uh, I know Nicole Ackman's a big fan of Crimson Peak, but you know, I, I, I go back and forth on that movie some days. Um, and I really haven't like loved, like outright loved a film like his since Pan's Labyrinth. And I do think that this movie, um, I, I was just nervous because it's like, okay, what's his going to be his take? What is his thing that's going to make his stand out? And I, by the end of it, I was like you, I was trying to console you, but I was also trying to keep my tears on the inside because it's such a beautiful movie. It's so personal. And it feels like the most personal thing he's done in like 20 years. Um, He's been trying to make this for such a long time and tell it from his perspective. And um, yeah, you're right about the animation. This whole animated team deserves so much credit. I mean, it it should, you know, be the big contender for Netflix because it, everybody in that room fell in love with it. It's hard not to fall in love with Guillermo del Toro to begin with uh, because he's such a harbiter and lover of cinema. And the way he talks about cinema and movies in general is very infectious. But then when you see a movie like this on the screen with an audience, um, you feel that itch. You feel that love, that labor of love that's put there. Um, and uh, I think the voice casting is incredible. Uh, Kate Blanchett deserves two Oscars now. Uh, she's incredible in this movie. Uh, I think the score by Alexander Desplat is one of the best scores of the year. I keep saying this. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you go back on the podcast, the last 25 episodes, you've heard best score of the year, best score of the year. We've had such a fantastic year for score, but this one is so sweeping and different and, and really calls back to some of the great stuff that he's done. But the original songs, Eric are whimsical and fun. And then Chow Papa hits and just get ready to cry because it is a yeah. river of tears that went through that audience. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's unlike any Pinocchio movie that we've seen since the original Disney film, that's just considered one of the greatest animated films of all time. And I'm going to say this. I think I would probably go back to this one more than I probably would that old one. And I know it's, you know, that's recency bias or whatever, but it just, there's something, there's something about seeing your version for your generation uh, up on the screen and and it's it's also like you mentioned it, it has this uh, adoption uh, angle to it that I never saw coming I never saw that within the original uh, sort of story the the you know the fable fairy tale that this is based on that's almost a hundred years old um, but really it is it's about breaking down the misconceptions and of someone being different in a world that mm-hmm. is completely. Uh, angry, vapid, uh, and uh, and and just downright cruel. I mean, this is going on during World War II, Italy, and fascism. And there are Nazis, and there are bombs, and there are there there are a lot of dark themes mixed within this whimsical version of Pinocchio. And this and there's a very this, tiny Mussolini, and a very tiny Mussolini. Uh, Eric and him actually share the same boot size, but. <laughs> it's kind of funny that the Zemeckis Pinocchio and Del Toro Pinocchio both feature shit in the movies, but <laughs> very differently. <laughs> um, I think like Finn Wood, uh, Wolfhard is very good in the film. Christoph Waltz is our main villain, uh, sort of amalgamation of all the villains. Uh, David Bradley plays Geppetto. He's fantastic. But he's I mean, very, very, very good. good. But who, he's underrated as a like a non like star yeah cast member. He's fantastic. But so is Ewan McGregor, who yeah uh, plays you know <laughs> who right from the beginning is is basically doing his Moulin Rouge. I'm a writer. I'm like, a writer. What are you doing? Well, then it was also like a mix of that and like oh no, is he gonna start doing like you know his his Lumiere as well and and then it but close. it never goes out it was close but it doesn't get there it's not that bad i was like thank he, god he's not going from i i like what they do with his jiminy cricket yeah although he does veer into disney sidekick mm-hmm. quite a bit with all of the 
uh smashes and jokes he, he mm. gets he yeah he gets uh he gets beat up quite a bit yeah i was kind of i was kind of happy with that you yeah, know what i mean funny. but uh but the movie is super emotional mm-hmm. i think this movie is going to play really well not just on netflix but i think it's going to play really well this holiday season i i like i know it's you said it's uh it's a little you know it's a little bit unlike any pinocchio we've seen because it's a little bit darker a little bit harsher or whatever it's a lot darker uh, but uh but i don't care take the kids to it uh it's it's we don't get to celebrate this kind of animation that often and i'm kind of curious wh- where you see the movie going i mean i know we could talk about awards all day long but it it kind of feels like the way the room got swept up and we were just seeing how people were reacting. Um, I, it, I, th- it, I think it, it, it can do, be a player. I think it could do extremely well. It's a weird season for Netflix where they obviously, again, have lots of priorities and it's mm-hmm. hard to know where things are going to land um, and when something will kind of happen organically rather than, you know, the studio telling people here is the thing here's your power of the dog here's your roma mm-hmm. um and and i think it's i think it will be more like that but that said uh they are screening the hell out of this movie they want a best picture nomination mm. yeah no i i think i think they could get it with this mm-hmm. movie um I think if they played their cards right, they could even the way Del Toro is so loved and the way that this movie could be beloved, it could be a sneaky, maybe even director play. Um, you know, in a 10, I can see him. I mean, he could be kicking out some other people. Well, both as well. of them. It would be but it was, yeah, him and, and Gustafson. And Gustafson. Um, but uh it, you know maybe. I I I, I can see, I mean it should because it this is you're talking about a thousand days of putting this project together. It is a massive labor of love. Um, obviously, score, original song, like yeah. Chow Papa. Chow Papa should win original song. Like, what are we even talking about with all these pop stars? Like, it, it, I mean, that'd be a weird year in song. It's going to be very weird because you're going to have the popular, you know, pop artists, and then you're going to have something like this, maybe. And um, Diane Warren. And Diane. Well, of course, she like lives in there. Um, she's got a futon in that category. Yeah. Um, but uh, I and I mean, special effects could be on the table if Kubo and the they two really st- should be the should Kubo be and like, the two strings. Like, like with you know? Kubo and the two strings, it should mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, it'll definitely be obviously in the in the the short list for visual effects, and it should get in. Uh, I don't see any real competition for animated film. There is mm-hmm. no soul or there is no disney pixar really that i think can provide the type of competition that we've seen in the past yeah. there's no I'm, soul there's no toy story for there's nothing turning red and light year are not going to do that mm-hmm. strange world maybe yeah but i've heard no i've heard mixed things on it already it, it just doesn't no and then Nobody puss in boots about it. come on um <laughs> Yeah, there's no pull for it. So, yeah, I mean, it could because it's such a weak year, and they and if they really love the film, uh, Dark Horse and adapted screenplay, you can put that up there as well. Um, you know, because yeah. you know we were weak all category, we're, very weak category. Would it count for production design with all that stuff, like the creation of the characters? All, and all of it does. Everything yeah. counts. It's and I don't know how you. I don't know how you don't category. nominate it. I don't know how you don't nominate it. It's impeccable work. That impeccable. branch has that branch has always uh, mistreated stop motion animation. I don't know how you couldn't. I mean, like he's literally at parties and at places that I was was able to go to. He's they're bringing the puppets everywhere. He's working with them. Clearly, he was very hands on with it, obviously, mm-hmm. and trying to show. Um, the emotionality of of how he created these 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 people through these animated figures and you kind of forget like you were mentioning earlier you kind of forget that it's animated at a certain point you kind of forget that these are yeah. not a computer and uh it, because it's so effortlessly put together it's an yeah. extraordinary piece of work yeah it really yeah. is yeah and also it was great to see eric cry yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it but you only cry for movies that that really matter to you in this world. Not just you, but anybody. And uh, mm-hmm. it's it's a really good movie. And I can't wait for everyone uh, to see it over the next couple of weeks. I know it's in limited theaters right now. And yep. on December 9th is when it'll hit Netflix. And everybody yes. can stream it there. Uh, two more things. And then we can wrap this thing up real quick. Um, I saw The Eternal Daughter, which is the new film from Joanna Hogg. And Eric, you haven't seen the film, right? No? Yes. I have not. You haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, I won't go into it too much uh, because we got a big film to talk about at the end of this. And that is, uh, I, I thought it was pretty good. Like I, I was surprised at how much I liked it. It's very um, gothic ghost story, uh, really limited characters, one location, uh, very unlike the other, you know, films that have come out from Joanna Hogg, especially the souvenir part one and two uh, souvenir part one, not a big fan of it. <laughs> and uh the souvenir part two i just never got around to seeing so i was really nervous because this is sort of like a continuation of the themes and the characters from the from those films and Tilda Swin plays both uh lead roles here and i think she is fantastic in this movie it's so eerie and yet it's so um such an interesting way of going through an uh an artist's kind of relationship with their parent and grief and everything that is evolving and the paranoia of the decisions of their past. Uh, I think that the movie is uh, got like kind of maybe about five or 10 minutes, a little too long. It could have been under 90 for me because I think it lingers in some scenes uh, too much, but overall, I mean, double dose of Tilda Swinton in both Pinocchio and in the eternal daughter. I was like a Tilda Swinton weekend, man. Uh, I think it's uh, Hogg's best film that she's had uh, come out over the last couple of years. And I was, I was a big fan of it. It it has sort of that signature a 24 box frame rate, uh, you know, sort of style. And it's very claustrophobic as uh, has some, some really great uh, food scenes in it too, as well. Um, but ultimately it's just like a, a very solid Gothic uh, sort of thriller. Uh, paranoia thriller and I, and I quite enjoyed it uh and the last thing that you know, i saw that eric and i were like the last night talking about i think the most uh was steven spielberg's the fablements which is a, a movie that eric saw back at tiff and uh and he was like saying and everyone was saying to me kevin was saying this you were saying this to me uh, I think our friend uh, and colleague here at Awards Watch, Sophia Simonella, who recently saw the film too, was saying, Ryan, this is like a movie that you are going to uh, just go head over heels. This is so for you. This is so in your wheelhouse because how much you love cinema and da 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 da. And, and um, it's it's kind of nice to know uh, that my friends know the, <laughs> which movies I'm going to like uh, because it's a good movie, Eric. It's a really good movie. Yeah. We're all really just waiting for you to see uh, Avatar The Way of Water. <laughs> wow, this is the best film of the year. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yes, yes. Mom, the my masterpiece. Is, it's, it's a movie. It's a movie. About movie. the movies. <laughs> it's very good. It's very Spielberg. Everything yeah. from its head to its toe. It's It has all of the finishing touches. Of a Spielberg movie. I mean, within the first two, three minutes of this movie, you have Sammy Fableman, who's, you know, trying to get the gumption to go into his first film. And his parents are kind of trying to explain it to him of how it works and how scared he is. I had that when I was a kid. I was the same way, too, of like, it's going to be what? And his parents explained to him how it all works and everything much better explanation in this than in uh, empire light, by the way. And, <laughs> and then they go in there and that kid is glued and he's hooked. And I think that that is what the movie really is. It is about like how movies and filmmaking can capture our imagination, capture our obsession. Right. And then, how it can be a tool to guide us in our life, how to fix things. Um, also how it can be uh, a, a determinant of innocence 
as well. Like the movie has all these avenues in which Sammy's filmmaking and the movies that he's shooting on his camera either help or hurt the trajectory of where he's at in his life and how that can jade somebody and how that can inspire someone. Like, and that is really what has happened with Spielberg throughout his life for most of his career it was very much on his mother's side because he was very angry with his father and they've had this reconciliation and it's kind of done the complete 180 and this movie I get what you and others have said this is a movie very sentimental it's very much not trying to blame anyone or anything in this movie uh, I don't think that there is like he's not punching down on his mom he's not punching down on his dad he's not punching down on his sisters or even himself he's sort of just presenting a semi-autobiographical take of how he w- wishes events might have played out how he feels now are all these relationships to come where they are where they're in a better place as a family and yes they did have rocky roads to get there um but it's also then about how he became who he is there are excellent sequences where you get sort of behind the scenes look um eric of like how he early on his career you knew he was going to be steven spielberg i mean the the scene where he figures out how to get the gunshots to look like actual gunshots firing off when he has no budget no real guns to speak of and even his father who's uh, you know burt played by paul dano is so skeptical of this hobby even he can't go without saying, how did you do that? How did, how did you, where did you come up with that idea? Like that is an insane way of doing it. And um, I think Michelle Williams is, is, is Michelle Williams and she's very over the top. Um, but I think it's very measured at times too. It's, it's a fine line. Um, I mentioned that in the review for the film that I, I think it's a delicate balance. I don't know how you have felt, stepping away from the film for such a long time and what you've thought about it since, but seeing it more recently, I, I don't think it's as crazy as people have thought it was or, or wacky as people think it is. I think it's, I think it's a complicated it's a character. Bit, a little, I think it, it's it a complicated a character. When, when, when she's, she gets really deep into her mental illness, it's, mm-hmm. it's a lot. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily sentimental. I think it's more nostalgic than sentimental. Because yeah, maybe there, maybe there are so thing. many scenes that you know when you when you leave a situation and you you feel like oh I wish I I had said this in the moment. There's a lot of that here, mm-hmm. so it's it's a bit of corrective history of yes. your own life. Um, it's a, I get beautifully shot. Uh, I think everybody is very good. I think Michelle Williams is really really wonderful. Yeah, and. Yeah, he doesn't shy from really looking at and showing her struggle. Mm. And it's pretty immense. Yeah. Uh in in this. I think yeah. everybody's really good. I think Daniel's really good. Gabriel Labelle is a I mean, wonderful star. Gabriel Labelle blew me away in this film. Like it's yeah. It, you know. And then Judd yeah. Hirsch in his uh, yeah. Judd Hirsch sequence. Did. That everyone's talking about. I thought it was going to be more, honestly, to tell you the truth. And... I thought there was actually going to be less. I mean, <laughs> what what I what I had heard is that it was really just one scene, but it's really two. It's at the kitchen table, bedroom, and then very briefly, you know, the, out in, in the, the driveway. Car. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's that's a sequence. It's not one scene. So he yeah. has like almost ten minutes of time, which is considerable. Yeah, he's just like owning it. Yeah, but he's, he's saying he's, the thesis of the film. Really. Yeah, which is, you know, it's that can it be works. very hit and miss when when a character is basically underlining for you in dialogue the theme and everything. It's like, mm-hmm. we already know that, mm-hmm. but, you know, I guess you're just going to go ahead and tell us anyway. <laughs> but I think that and a bunch of other stuff is why I think that the screenplay by Spielberg and Kushner um ultimately works and the film ultimately has to work because of that because of these characters and and how they're described and how 
yes, it could be nostalgic, sentimental, however you want to describe it, but ultimately do they work as actual characters? If I did not know any of the contextuality about Steven Spielberg's life, do they just work as these people called the Fablemans? Do they just work as a family and what's going on? Yeah, I, think I mean, they the do. movie is not called the Spielbergs. No, but I mean, we are. all we know that, but some yeah. audience members might not know the full story of him and they have to work on that level. And I think that her scene is, I think a lot of us don't get in our lives, which is somebody to tell us, no, don't listen to the, the naysayers, your parents. If you want to do something, you want to be an artist, punch forward and do it. You might upset the apple cart in your own, even in your own family. Um, but it'll be worth it uh, in the end because you'll be doing what you're doing and you, cause you have a gift. And I kind of uh, wish it it had been a little bit more playful. It has a lot of moments. It's very so it's, none yeah. like the last yeah. shot. The last shot oh is, I mean, you're either going to love it or you're going to really hate it. I I'm not it. sure there's a lot of in the middle there. Mm. Um, the last five minutes of that movie. I well, the I mean, biggest goddamn grin on my face when yeah, I was watching the last it. five minutes are, are pretty wild. And it's it's great. I mean, funny. like, I don't want to get into it, but sometime we will get into it because it's like the be- greatest cameo of all time. And yeah. when and when it does happen, when I do talk about it, the layers to which that cameo is, mm-hmm. is actually quite astonishing of what yeah. Steven Spielberg is actually saying or Kushner saying there, too. And it's like, OK. I'm down for either way you want to interpret this because it's great because <laughs> I agree. Um, but yeah, that final shot is, it's a great note to end on, but like I told you, weirdly enough, I could have gone for another 10, 15 minutes of this. movie. Absolutely not. I would I have hated have. the movie had it gone after that shot. I would have loved it. More. I would have hated it. I was, I was just like, but I felt like it's indulgent enough. No, I think the third act is so perfect. And it just, you're on this if ride. It's perfect, then that's why it ends. But it kept could have kept going, and I would have been then totally okay be with it. Oh, it would have been perfect, because it's on a momentum of being perfect. And, no, and because and it, it, it has going. to close with his wonder the way that it opens with his I wonder. Know, I know. But I would have loved to see, like, I don't know. I just, I, I, I got comfortable so much enough in this movie by the end that if they kept going for another hour, I would not have said to stop the camera. Well, it's certainly not a challenging watch for a no. viewer. No, it's not. Well, I think the middle is a little bit of the challenge, going to be a challenge for some people because um, because that's the, it's not the cleanest. Um, the beginning yeah, is very it's, clean. And, it's and sort of clean. representative of how erratic Williams yeah. is. Yep, it's exactly. Kind of okay. And how he sees it. Yeah, for her. I was not bothered by, by no. that. No, no. It's a movie that after we were um, having dinner together after I saw the film and I was, I was having these qualms, but then I got on the plane and I started sitting there thinking about writing it and then I wrote it and I bumped up the grade because it just got better the more I thought about it. And I told you when I saw it the first time and I already have a screening uh, for it locked down again uh, the week of Thanksgiving, uh, which is, uh, I think it's going to play so much better on rewatches for so many people. And it's um, it's also another one that's going to be playing right now during the the Thanksgiving holidays and, and families are going to see it. And uh, um, it'll be interesting because it's a it's a heavy film. It's a long film. Um, but I didn't feel the length and the audience there in the room I mean, they were clapping at almost everything. They ate it up, and it didn't. It does help when the when the master himself comes out there and starts talking right before the film, and you know the cast comes out. Surprised there wasn't a Q and A, but it was kind of late. Um, but but I mean, I've been pushing back all year against saying that it, it is the quote unquote number one for best picture, and I've been putting other films in there um, just because I was like, really, is it is it going to be that? And then. Yeah, I think it kind of is at this point, like the more I thought about it and we were trying to figure out what what goes with it in terms of wins. And it's probably like director and screenplay and Mm -hmm. score and maybe production design, 
at edit. I think editing is on the table. I mean, like, my God, it's a movie for editors. There's so many sequences where he's editing film. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, and these are 40, 50 year relationships with all the people that he's working with on this movie. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's kind of like teed up for that. So. Yeah. yeah. And we know this is the last film for John Williams. So yeah, there will be, you know, a little bit oh. of, well, yeah. You know, everybody's fighting not, for the four other he, spots. He, like, you know, he already has 50 something nominations. So. Yeah, but he's he hasn't had like a win in decades. So, I mean, I'm not mad about that. Oh, okay. Uh, what? He was there that night too, which was kind of astonishing. I, I yes, I like he's like eighty something years old. Let him be at home. I think he's you know? older than that. No, he's well, he's like late eighties, right? He's like eighty eight. I thought he was nineties. No, 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 no. He's. I don't think he's. Oh, well, maybe he is. I don't know. I don't care. Um, he's still great. He's he's an icon. Uh, but yeah. So that was that was I know it was kind of brief. We didn't talk about like 700 movies, but it was it was a good AFI. Um we uh we had a good time. Did you have a good time? I did. It was not my favorite AFI though. It was uh it was a much more difficult process than it has been in years past. It was mm-hmm. a little frustrating janky and unorganized in a lot of ways whether it was uh the festival ticket process itself and Mm -hmm. or the studios everything you know you kind of have to wait till you're there there's there's a little bit of that every year anyway Mm -hmm. where it's just like you kind of take a risk and it's you go and you hope that you get the things that you're going to get because sometimes you do and sometimes you don't it was a little patchy but we we got into most the things we wanted to see and did most of the things we wanted to do. And we got to see so many great people that we mm-hmm. work with or that we admire or that are friends of the show. And it was a great, great weekend. Uh, we, we, got, we had some things that we probably don't even remember because we had too much fun. And ultimately I, that's me, that's you. Um, but so uh, ultimately we just had a great time. It was, uh, it was also just kind of nice to cap off the festival season with you. Right, boss? Mm-hmm. It was a lot of fun. And um, so we are going to probably just cut it there and get out of here. Unless you got something else you want to mention, Eric. No, Eric's like, cut it out. No, Keep good. it under an hour. Yes. Um, Eric Where's Anderson. The editor? <laughs> Eric Anderson, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, hopefully here at awardswatch.com and then yeah. obviously mm-hmm. awards watch under or awards underscore watch on Twitter and just awards watch on Instagram. Yeah. I'm trying to get back to. You should get on. Oh, what What's your letterbox? Uh, I think it's just awards watch. There you go. All right. Just trying to all get I do is scores. I don't write anything on there. Same here. Uh, I just all do, I do is, is the scores. Yeah. You, uh, if you want to follow me for now, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram and Letterbox at Ryan McQuaid 77. I don't know. These sites seem to be falling apart left and right as, as, as we're hanging on by a thread as a society every single day. Um, if you want to read my reviews for both Pinocchio and the Fablemans, you can over at awardswatch.com. I'm really proud of those uh, reviews. I thought they came out really great. And uh, and then we also have other covers from uh, Abe and Catherine on the site as well from AFI. So we had that covered next week or in a couple of days, mind you, on the show. Uh, we'll have the gang back. We're going to talk uh, Wakanda Forever, which is the uh, new big Marvel release. We'll also talk about some of our favorite sequels of all time. Do some listener questions and maybe have time for a game. But until then, we will see you all next time.